such theological imagination is important. I think this kind of theological imagination is one of the pathways to dialogue that we want to talk about. And this theological imagination is not lacking in our own day. It exists, and it is nourished by reading and rereading our sacred scriptures and reflecting upon their address to our contemporary realities. And so for the next just very few minutes, I would like to give examples of three ways in which this theological imagination has been nourished in recent years. Uh, and again, I'm thinking especially of Christian-Muslim relations uh, here in this country. So first of all, among Muslims, I think in the first place of the great emphasis that has been placed in recent years on the verses in the Quran that speak of the God-willed character, the God-willed character of human diversity. Again and again, whether at interfaith gatherings or in essays of various sorts, our attention has been called to texts such as Surah Al-Hujurat 49 verse 13, which goes something like this, Humankind, we have created you from a single male and a single female, and have made you nations and tribes, that you may come to know one another. The noblest of you in God's sight is the most God-fearing. God knows and observes all things. And another great verse of this sort is from Surah Al-Ma'idah 5, verse 48, where we read something like this. If God had willed, he could have made you all one community. However, God has willed to test you by what he has given you. So compete with one another in doing good. You will all return to God, and he will give you to know about the things in which you differed. These verses are frequently quoted and recited, and I believe that in the quotation and recitation, they have been forming the imaginations of their hearers, Muslims and others. Muslims have been reflecting and writing about these and other verses of tolerance. At the same time, many of us from outside the Muslim community have been listening carefully. We've been led in this listening to ponder the mystery of the one human family, our God-willed diversity, the way God tests us through what God gives us, the human task of coming to know one another, and if there is to be competition, that it be competition in goodness, and the reality of our return to God, who alone has the last word, which means that we can leave that last word about our differences to God. These are, these are texts that help create that greater human we, a diverse we, but not an us over against them. There are excellent examples of Muslims reflecting on these Quranic verses uh, in publications ranging from Professor Khalid Abul Fad's important 2002 essay on the place of tolerance in Islam to a recent uh, study on the history of the interpretation of Quran verse 548 by Munan Sirri in the journal Islam and Christian Muslim Relations. What is quite humbling for a Christian, especially a Christian theological teacher like me, is to find Muslims reflecting not only on Quranic verses, but also on Bible verses, and that with great sophistication and passion. This is the second point now. This is exactly what we find in that well-known document, a common word between us and you. In this gathering, I don't think I need to say much about a common word. You recall that it is an open letter issued on October 13th, 2007, which happened to be Eid al-Fitr that year. It was signed originally by 138 Muslim leaders and scholars from around the world, and it was addressed to the heads of Christian churches. In that text, very quickly, it goes to the Bible to the passage in the Gospel of St. Mark where Jesus Christ says, I quote, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. That's Mark 12, 29 through 31, and those are words that for many years I heard every single Sunday in church. The letter, a common word, then proceeds to make the argument that these two commandments, the love of God and the love of the neighbor, are foundational also to Islam, and thus form common ground between Islam and Christianity. In this, the letter moves in the very best traditions of what Christians call apologetic theology. That is, in which one defends one's own faith by making an argument in the other's language. Christians talk about love all the time. The authors of A Common Word show that they too can negotiate that vocabulary, and just, just so, they challenge Christians about their seriousness. Are Christians really serious about loving the neighbor? Or, as the text itself asks, and rather plaintively, I quote, is Christianity necessarily against Muslims? End of quote. The letter suggests that the answer should be an emphatic no, and quotes Jesus. He who is not against us is with us, is on our side. He who is not against us is on our side. Christians and Muslims need not be against one another. And of course, we can include other faith communities here as well. We need not be against one another. Rather, we are called on to love the neighbor, including the neighbor of different faith traditions, and just so the us-them divide can be bridged. A greater we is possible. And third, so far in this section of the talk, I've spoken of Muslims emphasizing and reflecting upon important Quranic verses, as well as Muslims discovering common ground in the Christian scriptures. But let me say that Christians too have been searching the scriptures in this past decade and more, looking for guidance for how to live in a world that Christians share with people of other faiths. In the first place, I have heard and read many reflections on what some call the outsider stories in the Bible. Stories in which someone from outside the narrowly defined community of faith brings blessing or challenge or is held up as a model for behavior. My friend Professor Terence Fretheim of Luther Seminary wrote a book on the biblical stories about Abraham. And in it, he lifts up the role played by the outsiders. In Genesis chapter 14, there's Melchizedek, priest of El Elyon, God Most High, who blesses Abraham. In chapter 18, there are the mysterious angelic visitors who bring the extraordinary news that elderly Sarah will bear a child, a story, of course, known to both the Bible and the Quran. In chapter 20, there's King Abimelech of Gerar, who speaks a word of harsh truth to the patriarch, and so on. And then in the New Testament, there are many such stories, many such outsider stories. According to St. Matthew's Gospel, it is the Magi, strange, exotic, unexpected characters, astrologers from the East, who are the first to come and reverence the child Jesus. According to St. John's Gospel, Jesus asked for a drink of water from a Samaritan woman and then proceeded to have something like an interfaith dialogue with her. And in St. Luke's Gospel, we find the famous parable of the Good Samaritan, where it is the despised outsider who is held up as a model of what it means to be a neighbor. In all of these stories, the scriptures are telling their readers to pay attention to those around you. Listen to the word that comes from outside the immediate community. You'll be blessed by it. You'll be instructed by it. You'll be called to account by it. 
In the past years, we have also seen a burst of Christian theological and pastoral reflection on the practice of hospitality. I think in large part because of the challenges of faithful living in religiously plural communities, but also in response to the immigration debate and debates about human sexuality. In any event, if Muslims reflecting on verses such as 49.13 and 5.48 in the Quran have been developing a Quranic vision of religious diversity, Christians reflecting on a wide range of biblical passages have been elaborating a Christian theology of hospitality. Hospitality which is increasingly acknowledged as a central Christian practice in which human beings imitate and even participate in the divine hospitality. Or let me put that into almost Ghazalian terms. Christians have discovered that in the Bible, hospitality is an attribute of God. 